Welcome back everyone. Today we've got a fascinating piece of news because in a shock move, a year and a half after the very explosive breakup of NetEase and Blizzard that saw like teams be disbanded, it saw insults being hurled, it saw a literal statue, right? The orc statue being destroyed. Well, now it turns out the Blizzard games will be coming back to the Chinese market. And that to me is interesting for a few extra reasons above just talking about it because it's interesting industry news. Number one, they actually had, right? A World of Warcraft MMO that is not World of Warcraft in development with NetEase, right? They actually had a WoW MMO set in a different time period. Um, that's, uh, that's one thing that came out whenever this whole story exploded. There's that, and then obviously in and around the time of the Burning Crusade Classic, people noted just how many parses were from Chinese guilds. Well, Season of Discovery, by all accounts, has been absolutely ginormous that now being open to the Chinese market could matter quite a bit. Now, of course, with this being done, everybody is, you know, giving their most conciliatory uh, comments, right? You know, the new leadership under Microsoft here are seemingly making it a top priority to get back into one of these large markets. And a lot of the rough words shared in the past are being glossed over. What we're going to do today is analyze what's going on, why it's happened, what this means for all the parties involved, any potential impact on games that we could feel, maybe even in the West, and of course, the ultimate question, is this all because Bobby left? It could be. And while he has not joined Games, uh, he should because it would be funny and uh, you should because we do extra things over there. And it's also, well, frankly, it is the best way to support what we do. My long-term goal is to not have to rely on AdSense or sponsor stuff and to be more direct to the community, obviously with groups like Second Wind, uh, you know, appearing and getting a lot of independence by, um, you know, just relying less on the old school funding model. That's, uh, that's certainly inspirational. Over there, we do loading screen, which is our daily newsletter, and you get access to our videos early and ad-free. So uh, yeah, look, you guys have really made a difference. It's been a bit of a rougher time, and uh, yeah, it, it means a lot. But okay, let's get into the story then. So in November 2022, NetEase's contract to distribute Blizzard games in China basically expired, right? And this contract had been in since 2008. It wasn't renewed, it just expired, and that meant that, uh, well, just boom. The, the, the games just stopped, <laughs> which was pretty crazy for loads of Chinese gamers who, I mean, like we know World of Warcraft massive in China. I think Overwatch did pretty well too. I mean, even if you take the Warcraft movie, that basically wasn't a financial flop because the Chinese market actually showed up to watch it. So they do love the Blizzard properties over there. Obviously you've got Diablo Immortal, a game that they did with NetEase, which I'd say is pretty damn uh, targeted to the Chinese market. So yeah. It basically mattered a lot. And per the New York Times's understanding, we have a video today. And basically the way it went down is the contract just expired. They were not able to renegotiate it, right? So that ended up being a pretty crazy situation for a lot of Chinese gamers. We know the Blizzard games are really popular over there. And even if you take something like the Warcraft movie, China saved it from being a total financial flop. And of course there's Diablo, obviously Diablo Immortal, which was a co-production done with NetEase that ultimately wasn't impacted by the other stuff. But uh, yeah, they were working fairly closely together. The thing is though, when the contract expired, well, both parties probably wanted a better deal for themselves. Now, the reasons behind this are interesting. Per the New York Times, NetEase just wanted a better deal than the usual licensing model that they have. At the time, they were pretty worried about regulations, of course, coming in from the government over there. They have been clamping down on games. They've been enforcing essentially like hourly time limits uh, for people of certain ages. It's a whole big thing. It basically meant though that the games industry in China was kind of rattled. They weren't feeling as confident about their domestic markets. So they, uh, you know, they, they did want other things. That's one of the reasons why you see the likes of NetEase and Tencent, uh, you know, just investing across the world. So thing number one, NetEase wanted a better deal. Thing number two, Bobby Kotick was alleged to have believed that the NetEase CEO, William Ding, was threatening Activision into a better deal by suggesting that NetEase may have influence over the, uh, the party regulator's approval of the Microsoft Activision Blizzard King acquisition. So that's fairly interesting. Bobby having that understanding, of course, means that this would have been a way more tense negotiation, right? Where there's not actually trust in both parties and there is a feel that they're both trying to 
just, well, use the leverage they have against each other. Now, for their part, NetEase actually disputes that. They dispute the IP licensing allegations and the allegations that they were threatening. Now, this story got spicy whenever Simon Zhu, who is NetEase's president of global investment and uh, partnerships, right? He basically said that this was because of one person. So here, uh, here is the quote, it's quite something. One day when what has happened behind the scenes could be told, developers and gamers will have a whole new level understanding of how much damage a jerk can make. He said that. Now, obviously, we know that times have changed. We know that the business relationship is changing, that a deal has been signed. And that obviously means we've got to ask the question, what changed? Yes, there's the Microsoft ownership, but also it's no longer Bobby Kotick. So recently, photos have captured the new president of Blizzard, Johanna Farris, meeting with uh, NetEase executives. And then there's just been a lot of market speculation suggesting that some sort of relationship here, like that basically the icy situation is thawing. And as much as yes, Bobby's gone, also the acquisition has taken place. That probably means there's a different power relationship because obviously Microsoft are very big and very strong. Um, but ultimately this has all meant one thing and that is that Blizzard are now going to be fully back into the Chinese market and seemingly they'll be right in time for the war within launch. One of the rough things last time round is, well, if you like Dragonflight and you were in China, good luck. I suppose go play in the Taiwanese servers or I don't know, maybe the Korean servers or something. Now, the deal being back on, of course, does mean statements from Phil Spencer, Joanna Faris and William Ding. But honestly, going through the statements, they are the absolute... I mean, look, it's just a corporate PR, you know, happy, happy. We're immensely grateful and yeah, blah, 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 demonstrating commitment. It, it's just that kind of thing. There's really not that much analysis. Now, where there is a little bit of analysis, though, is that while NetEase did actually keep a little bit of a skeleton crew on, they ultimately are in a situation where the teams to actually do this stuff, they don't exist anymore. And that actually does mean that they can't just flick the servers back on, right? There's no quick way to do this. So those teams needing to be bulked up and actually rebuilt does mean that the games won't be coming out immediately. So the first ones are Overwatch, Hearthstone, World of Warcraft, Diablo, Starcraft, and Heroes of the Storm. Those will be returning from summer 2024. And they don't actually have specific details. I imagine they just want Overwatch ASAP and then World of Warcraft in time for the War Within, but maybe also in time for the next phase of Season of Discovery, because again, Again, if you remember what those parse counts looked like from, say, Sunwell and the Burning Crusade Classic, it was abundantly clear that that was massively popular in the Chinese market. Now, this also gets interesting because it ain't just Activision Blizzard. Microsoft Gaming and NetEase have also entered an agreement to basically explore bringing new NetEase titles to Xbox consoles and other platforms. And this is not actually the first time that these companies have collaborated. Xbox gave NetEase the, um, well, the partnership to distribute Minecraft in China, which is pretty big. And then NetEase gave the first look rights to Naraka Blade Point, actually. And that's, you know, it's not about Royale that's putting out like the, the big millions of player counts, but it is just quietly, stably very successful from all that I understand anyway. Really, I think with Microsoft and NetEase already having a relationship, I mean, it was probably easy to get something like this across the line. What would be interesting to me though, is what sorts of uh, differences are there in the terms here? Have NetEase actually been able to push things a little bit further? Because yes, Microsoft, very strong, massive company, but also Microsoft in the gaming sector definitely underpowered as compared to how many resources they really should have. Now, there's a few other interesting things to note, kind of esoteric things. As an example, remember Overwatch 2's Steam launch and the review score, right? Do you remember that? Well, that wasn't just what we all thought it was. And at the time we did say this, um, but basically, in majority, right, by the actual raw number of reviews, remember the population is absolutely humongous, um, you know, of China, the Steam negative scores were actually in great part people using Steam to express how angry they were that Blizzard games were being pulled, right, from the Chinese market. So a lot of that with Overwatch is people being angry over Overwatch, yes, but a lot of that is actually people in the Chinese market. And as spotted by Daniel Ahmed, here's some of the numbers. Nearly two thirds of reviews were in simplified Chinese. And of those, right, and nearly two thirds, that's 63,000 reviews. And of those 63,000, 97% were negative. 
So that really just tells you how angry people were. This was the one way that they could actually express that anger. And of course, for Blizzard, it led to a very awkward situation where their Western release game, Overwatch 2, is actually being humongously dragged down in its review score because of a humongous, I mean, a review nuke, basically, from uh, Chinese gamers who were angry that a bunch of business dealings meant they could no longer play the games that they love. The sheer scale of the Chinese audience can be seen even in Steam player numbers, right? Like, you will often see in and around, like, sort of peak Central Asia time zone uh, times, you'll see a pretty damn big surge in the player numbers on Steam, right? And a lot of that is going to be people in China using a VPN to play in the same Steam that we play on. So, you might also have been thinking, hang on, did China not humongously clamp down on, uh, on video games? Well, here's something from Forbes. Despite recent regulatory headwinds, China is still the world's largest market for mobile games with 37 billion in sales last year, according to estimates from the research firm Omida. The US, the second largest, generated 22 billion in mobile game sales, again, according to them. So, Look at the size there in the mobile market. Now, I think there's probably going to be different weightings. I think obviously mobile is bigger in China, and that actually does take us on to another World of Warcraft game. So one of the things that was the most fascinating to me when this entire thing went tits up is that we learned, I believe it was people who leaked to Jason Trier. I'm not 100% sure because that's just off my memory, but there was a World of Warcraft MMO. It was intended to be mobile first, but who knows, it could have been like a Genshin Impact sort of situation. And it was being developed by NetEase, right? Now, obviously, there would have been supervision and that sort of thing going on from the, you know, the, the main sort of Blizzard development center in Irvine. But it does seem that it was largely made by Netties. That's a little bit like how, say, Diablo Immortal, a lot of that in terms of just like raw production headcount, from what we understand anyway, a lot of that is Netties. That's very different to, say, Warcraft Rumble, which is entirely an in-house Blizzard thing. So in this case, it would have been Blizzard licensing out World of Warcraft, well, for, for a, I suppose, a Chinese market first MMO. But realistically, I mean, if you take a look at Genshin Impact, you think about those numbers. I mean, if you're Bobby, surely you're going to think that that's something that you want. Um, obviously, not enough for Bobby to be conciliatory and uh, make a deal. So the whole thing ended up going tits up. The other incentive to make a deal then basically just comes from Xbox needing to make money. Phil Spencer has talked multiple times about how he does have to actually run a profitable business. And you may laugh at that, but he basically said that because the kind of vibe from everyone was Microsoft is so loaded. It's got so much money that they don't really need to worry that much. Um, right, and uh, I suppose to say, no, no, we're serious, and uh, a part of our constraints is we need to actually be profitable. We can't just continue throwing money into a pit. Um, well, Phil Spencer, I suppose, felt the need to correct the record on that, right? So he essentially, I would say, can't afford to not have a chunky revenue stream coming from Blizzard titles in the Chinese market. It would be insane to just say no to that. And that happening, even if it's not a perfect deal, that's obviously going to be preferable to, well, not having any of that money because the deal wasn't good enough. Ultimately then, I think this is going to be rather impactful. So thinking about Season of Discovery, like, man, that, that could be huge. The TLDR with WoW subscribers is... <laughs> Man, it's kind of hard to do short, but basically it is that WoW Classic was an absolutely humongous peak, right? Whenever Original Classic uh, launched. TBC and Wrath Classic, actually not so much. Hardcore had a decent little bump, but when you take a look at the stuff that Blizzard showed off in uh, their GDC talk, I mean, you really just do see... You know, Dragonflight is retaining people better. Like, Dragonflight's doing a, an amazing job in that way. But the thing that actually made the numbers just go to the moon it was Season of Discovery. So in China, what do we know we have? We know we have an audience that loves World of Warcraft, and we know we have an audience that loves Classic, right? So, I mean, who knows with Cataclysm Classic, but at the very least, I'd say Season of Discovery in China. Uh, I think that could, I just think that could do massively well. The other thing there is if they were doing that, I've got to imagine they wouldn't just be you know, flicking it on at phase four. No, they're probably going to be doing a, a full launch of that as its own, you know, little separate part of WoW. So whenever that happens, that's just going to be an absolutely humongous uh, thing for them. From what I understand, and, and Blizzard kept on saying this as time went on, and this is a little bit of the later period whenever they were struggling with subscriber numbers, but they were still reporting them. 
you would a lot of the time hear that in the West, WoW was doing fine, but it had definitely suffered more in the Eastern market. Now, if that trend is still a thing and modern WoW is just inherently not as appealing to that audience, then yeah, I, I think Season of Discovery could be absolutely humongous. The problem, or the sad thing at least, it's not really a problem for them, it's a problem for us. It is that post-merger, we get far less information about Blizzard stuff in the quarterly earnings calls. So if there is a massive thing, it might be called out. We maybe will get a statistic, but not the sort of thing that we used to get in the past. I think the thing that I am the most interested in, though, is what about that World of Warcraft MMO? Uh, what, what about it? Like, we don't really know that much. Ultimately, that would be a project that they need to resurrect. And resurrecting a project, that, that means building a team. And if you are building a team, a lot of that team is going to be different people than the people who were working on it previously. And that meant that either you get new people to catch up on somebody else's vision in a situation where they can't ask that other person because they don't work there anymore. It's either that or you basically just take a, another stab at it again, I suppose, and do like a harder reboot. I don't know what will happen there. I suppose, though, like, are the incentives that led to that being greenlit in the first place, do those still hold true? Because over that span of time, there have been a lot of worries about the state of gaming regulation for businesses trying to, uh, trying to operate in China. Things looked really bad for a bit. They then eased up. So I, I, I don't exactly know, but maybe if the big decision makers are worried that they could just be regulated uh, into oblivion, then, you know, maybe they won't do that sort of thing. But still, the reason why I was kind of interested in it, though, is they said it was going to be in another timeline. Or not timeline, sorry, like another era. Ma ma actually, maybe it is timeline. It could just be a translation issue from sources, but it seemed to be some sort of other era uh, that just got my brain kind of worrying. Anyway... Maybe we will see more collaborations and more projects. As an example, Microsoft love mobile, and they're not really that big in mobile indeed. You will have noticed through the whole like acquisition process, they kept on saying that they were really excited about King. Now, of course, you and I, like, I'm not excited about King. I don't think you're excited about King if you're watching this channel and, you know, Candy Crush and all of that stuff, but Microsoft were excited. And that means something because, well, you had Call of Duty Mobile. Now there's Warzone Mobile, which has got cross progression. And ugh, I don't really know what's going on there. I need to research that. Obviously, Diablo Immortal. If they could get something other than Warcraft Rumble, I mean, I'm sure they would be pretty excited by that. Assuming that their interest in mobile was genuine. And again, when you look at that difference of 22 billion USD revenue in the States for mobile versus 37 billion in the Chinese market, I mean, you're going to want a slice of that 37 billion. Problem is, though, are you going to go hard enough to get it? How gacha would they be willing to go for a Warcraft MMO like project? Uh, I suppose that's my leaving question. Anyway, that is it for today's video. Thank you for uh, stopping by. Let me know, especially if this if this impacts you and somehow you're actually watching this channel um, using a VPN in, uh, in, in China. And uh, I suppose if you've played with any people um, who are impacted by this, it would be really cool just to, uh, to hear how this is actually going down. Got to imagine if you, say, played WoW for 20 years, um, you know, in China and you loved it, and then it just disappeared for a year and a half. I mean, man, that would really suck. That would break up your social service gaming, right? So let me know. With that said, though, there will be a new video tomorrow, so subscribe for that and uh, check out this one next.